All right, welcome. Uh, thank you guys for joining. Today we're going to be doing a training session on calibrating a Zygo 3D optical profiler. Um, I'm going to give about 30, 45 seconds here just to see if a couple more people join. Um, and if not, we'll get started. So if you just can wait a couple of seconds here, have a little patience, that would be very appreciated. All right, uh, looks like we have most people who signed up here joining. So I'm gonna get started with the presentation. So like I said, uh, we're gonna be doing a training session here on calibrating a Zygo 3D optical profiler. So my name is Steven Munzee. I'm an applications engineer here at Zygo. I work out of our Middlefield office, uh, Middlefield, Connecticut. Today, I'm going to be joined by Dan Rosano. He's going to be helping field any questions you guys have. So um, if you have a quick question, he'll answer it by private message over the GoToWebinar interface. If you have a more general question, we might save it to the end for a live Q&A. Um, and if we happen to not be able to get to your question, we will answer it via email after the presentation. So what are we going to be covering today? So today, we're going to be looking at focusing an objective we're going to be doing a 3D reference cal. We're going to be looking at the 2D reference cal, and then we're going to be doing a lateral calibration as well. And we're going to be doing this all on our uh, Zygo NewView 9000 optical profiler. Um, and today's Zygo NewView uh, 9000 profiler is actually in one of our guardian enclosures, which is used in production environments where you may have some uh, vibrations, turbulence, uh, tougher environments that need uh, a little extra help. So first, let's get into the focusing of an objective. So Zygo manufactures focusable 20x and 50x objectives. You can see here that you're going to be able to focus these objectives by uh, rotating that bottom band where the label is on. Um, all of our other objectives are, are fixed focus, so you won't be this step won't be necessary if you have uh, a different set of objectives. Um, this is important because if an objective is out of focus with respect to the rest of the op optical system, there can be some potential biases in the final measurement results. Um, and each of our optical profilers in our series, so the next view, the new view, and the Z-gauge, are all going to require some slightly different techniques when focusing an objective. So what are we going to need for focusing an, obje an objective? Uh, we're going to need one of our systems, of course, the next view, new view, or Z-gauge. Um, we will also need a silicon carbide flat, um, and we're going to need a stable environment and a basic understanding of measuring the MX software. So I'm going to quickly change over to our MX software here. I'm going to share that screen. So to focus an objective, we can actually just move out in the space here. Um, then we're going to do an auto light level, F9 is the hotkey, or we can click auto light level, either way. And on the next view, we're actually going to manually move the F stop out, as you can see there. And you can see now this objective is already in focus, and we know that because we have the crisp edges on the, on the image there. I'm going to go and move it out of focus, and you can see how it becomes blurry. And now I'm going to move it back into focus here. So this is going to be um, very similar on our next view system, but the f-stop is all is within the head, so you need to use the software to manually close and open the f-stop, um, and that's going to be in the advanced tab. And we can see here we have the filter and the filter stop. We can't do anything here in the software because we're on it knows we're on a new view system. But if we we're on in next view, we'd be able to, we'd have a drop down menu with options to close or open the f stop. So a z gauge is going to be the most different because we don't have the f stop option. So on a z gauge, that's when we're going to need to use that silicon carbide flat or a super smooth or a smooth part with a sharp edge. So I've already saved the location 
just to save some time in our scratch pad. So we're going to go to the focus location. So here you can see it's driving to the edge of that silicon carbide flat. Now we're going to do an auto light level and we're going to go at half X zoom to make this more obvious. So when focusing on an objective using a uh, the edge of a surface, you're going to want to introduce a good amount of tilt into the part to make it obvious where the rest of the optical system is in focus and where it is not in focus. So I'm going to intentionally move this out of focus off the screen here. And now you can see in the center that we have a crisp image where on the edges it's getting it's starting to get blurry. Where the crisp image is is where the objective is going to be in focus. So I'm going to come back in here and move us back. Oop. Looks like I may have moved the part a little bit there. So I'm going to come back in here and move us back into focus, back into where the image is crisp. And now the objective should be focused. So I'm going to come up here and just verify using the technique we would normally do on the 9000. And yeah, you can see that the edges are very crisp. It's in focus. And this objective shouldn't have any biases due to being out of focus. Great. So let's move back to the PowerPoint presentation. So the next thing we're going to be looking at is our 3D, 3D and 2D reference calibration. So what we're going to need to create a 3D and 2D reference cal? Again, we're going to need one of our uh, one of our optical profiler systems. We're going to need the 30 millimeter or 50 millimeter silicon carbide flat. We're going to need a stable environment, and again, we're going to need a basic understanding of measuring using our MX software. So each calibration is going to be unique, and these certain uh, features are going to affect the calibration. So each objective itself is going to need its own 3D, 2D cal. Um, each zoom for each objective is going to need its own 3D, 2D cal. Same with the measurement mode and same with the camera mode. So if we have one setup we know we need to use, say, for example, we have a 50x at 1x zoom with CSI measurement mode at 1,000 by 1,000 camera mode, we can just uh, calibrate for that specific camera mode. But if we need to use, do multiple, we're going to have to do multiple calibrations. So why is the 3D calibration, uh, the 3D reference calibration important? So um, the 3D reference calibration is going to reduce this systematic error in the system. Um, and mostly, spe and specifically, that's going to be within the reference mirror of the system, which we can see in the image to the right. Um, so the silicon carbide flat has a surface thinness of approximately 3 angstrom and is generally used to generate a system reference file. Uh, for a typical measurement, the silicon carbide flat is going to be able to compensate for about 1 to 10 nanometers of residual form error imparted by the optical system. Um, and this is going to be important for several types of measurements. It's going to be important for um, if we're measuring a super smooth part, if we're measuring a part that has, if we're measuring a part that has form, um, if we're measuring, if we're doing a stitch measurement, so this 3D reference cal is, is actually going to be pretty critical uh, from a metrology standpoint. So the 2D reference cal, it's more of a qualitative calibration. Um, and it's really just used to unlock certain features on our next view and new view system. So uh, the 2D cal is used for it to unlock the higher contrast live display, um, the fringe free viewing, which you can see in the top image to the right. Um, in the true color mode, which is shown in the bottom image to the right. So let's get back to the MX software, and we're going to set that calibration. So to set the calibration, we're going to need we're going to want to focus on the center of the silicon carbide flat. And again, I save that location just for time's sake. All right, let's do another auto light level there and we should be good. So when we're doing a 3D or a 2D reference calibration, it's important that we have the part null on the stage. Um, if you remember earlier when we were focusing using the silicon carbide flat, we had a tight fringe pattern. We actually would only want one band of fringe, fringe on, the, 
on the display. So we would like the part to be as null as possible on the stage when doing this calibration. So we're going to come into the, let me just minimize this here. We're going to come into the calibrate tab and it's going to come into the system status tab, but we're going to want to go into calibration and go into objective calibration. Um, you'll see here that the last 3D reference cal, there is an old 3D reference cal. Um, and the way we know that there is one is that we can come in here and we can see the subtract system reference is enabled. If we have a mode that does not has not is missing a calibration completely, um, this will be disabled and we won't be able to use that function. So there was a calibration done at one point, but it was done before we installed this objective. So generally, every time you install the objective, I would recommend uh, running a new calibration. And we're going to do that here. Um, we're not going to do a 2D cal because it's really only qualitative and um, it's a little bit time consuming for a webinar. Uh, but all we would have to do is enable it and it would do both cals for us. If we don't, if we know we need to use multiple zooms, we can calibrate them all at all the zooms at once. Same with the measurement modes. And if we also need multiple camera modes shown in the advanced tab here, we can calibrate those all at once. But for, for time's sake, um, I'm only going to calibrate one setting. So if we come back into the advanced here, we can see that it sets the three reference cal threshold to seven days. That's really an arbitrary number. Um, and you should be, if your environment is changing throughout the day or throughout a month or a week, um, you should always be rechecking your calibrations to make their, make sure they're still valid. Um, you see here that we can do multiple averages. Um, if you have an, an environment that isn't super stable, the more averages you do, um, the more noise you're going to be able to reduce in that system reference file. Um, this is the reason we went to the center of the silicon carbide flat is because if you're doing averages, it's advantageous to move between averages. So if we were to have focus on the edge of this flat, um, when we were moving between the averages, it may have moved, it, it could have potentially moved off the part and failed the calibration. Um, and this is gonna allow us to focus at every site and tilt at every site to make sure that we are in best focus and auto tilting. Since we're only doing one site, that's not gonna be necessary here. So I'm gonna come back here. And now that we have everything set up the way we want it, um, I'm just gonna click calibrate objective. So now it's going through all the steps, it's doing the calibration scan. Um, this is gonna give you an idea about how long it's gonna take to do this 3D cal. Um, this is with only one uh, objective, zoom, measurement setting, and camera mode. Uh, if you do multiple, it's obviously gonna take a bit longer. So now it's, uh, it's just doing that first average one of one. It's gonna make the scan here. And there we are. So you see when we have a valid cal, it's going to turn green. It's going to show us that it's successfully calibrated. So now we know how to set our 3D and 2D reference cals. So let's get back to the presentation. So next, the next important step is verifying that that system reference file that we just set is a good system reference file and it's reliable and it's going to give us good metrology. So we can use that to check if the newly created one like we just made here is valid or an older one that may be out of that may be expired um, is still good to use. So to do that, we're going to take a measurement of the silicon carbide flat without subtracting the system reference. And then we're going to take a, a measurement of the silicon carbide flat with subtracting the system reference. And then we're going to go into the analyze tab uh, to look at the results. So the surface processing that we're going to need here um is this area step shown to the right and we're also going to want to do a plane remove if you're loading the base micro app um, this should already be the default setting so you're not going to have to change any of the surface processing so how are we going to check to see if a newly created system reference file is good we're going to visually look at the map and the color scale should be mostly random um, if you see any curvature or fringe print through, then the system reference likely needs to be redone. If you measured the silicon carbide flat using the Z resolution, Z resolution set to high, then we can actually look at the SA value, and that should be less than a nanometer. If you measure the silicon carbide flat uh, with the Z res set to normal, 
uh, then we can, again, look at that SA value and make sure it's less than three nanometers. So here, we're gonna go through a couple of maps just to show uh, the difference of taking the measurement without the system reference subtracted and taking it with a good system reference subtracted. So you can see here this measurement, um, we see some form in the part that's due to uh, noise in the system. But then when we subtract the system reference, we see that the SA value has decreased. We're getting uh, a more random uh, distribution of points and it looks pretty good. So same thing here. We can see that we have a lot of form without the system reference subtracted. Um, and then we can go here and we can see that the uh, SA has decreased significantly. And again, we're seeing that a lot of linearity, a lot of uh, randomly distributed points across the part. Here, we're gonna actually be looking at a bad system reference. And you can see we have that fringe print through. Um, and this is gonna put some biases in our measurements. And this is a case where we're gonna have to redo that system reference. So let's get back into the MX software and verify that that system reference that we set earlier is valid. So I'm gonna to move to, I'm gonna to drive to a different part on the flat and let's, let's disable the subtract system reference here. Um, and let's take a measurement. So again, you can see that there's a lot of form here um and there's definitely some error due to noise in the system so let's subtract the system reference we just took to make sure to verify that it's a good system reference and perfect looks great so we can see that the sa has gone down significantly below that one nanometer threshold when using that z res at high um we're putting it pretty linear throughout the surface which is what we expect because this is a super smooth part um, and we're seeing randomly distributed points across. So this, this passes the test. We set a good system reference file and we're ready to go take some good measurements. So let's get back into the presentation. Uh, last thing we're gonna cover here is gonna be the lateral calibration. So what we need here, we're gonna need one of our systems again. Um, we're gonna either need a precision lateral calibration standard or a feature with a known dimension. With a known dimension. However, that method is going to be a bit less precise, and I would, we would recommend using the precision lateral calibration standard if you had one available. Again, we're going to need a stable environment, and then we're going to also need that basic understanding of measuring using MX software. So why is a lateral calibration important? Whenever a measurement is performed for the purpose of getting a result that is a lateral dimension or has a lateral component, it is important that the system is well laterally calibrated to ensure confidence in the data. So some types of measurements that that includes is diameter of a hole, width of a scratch, radius, angle, um, and then general stitching, because when we're stitching each uh, site together, we want to make sure that the la it's laterally uh, accurate. All right, so let's get back to MX. And we're going to go into do this lateral calibration. So. To get to the lateral calibrator, you can either come into the tools, you can click lateral calibrator, um, you can click F7 on your keyboard. Uh, what I've gotten used to doing is going over into the objective, uh, right clicking on the mouse and then clicking lateral calibrator. So we're gonna, I'm gonna set the calibration for 1x zoom today. Um, and you can see here that the magnifications we are using right now are the nominal. And when, it, when we're using the nominal, it's gonna be italicized. And that's how we know that we don't have a lateral calibration set. So first, let's calibrate using the precision lateral calibration standard. Again, I have a saved location for that. So we're gonna to go to that location on the stage. So the lateral calibration here is going to have these etched boxes, um, uh, and there's going to be several different pitches to these boxes. Um, each different objective at a different zoom is going to require a different pitch value. Uh, the 50x at 1x zoom particularly requires the 10 micron pitch, uh, which I'm set to here. I'm going to do an autofocus because it looks like we might be slightly out of focus there. There we go. Let's do that auto light level. So when we're doing the lateral calibration, it's, it's best practice to have a few fringes diagonal 
as we see on the screen here. Um, then we're going to want to come in and do a and do an actual measurement. So I'm going to click measure. Boom! There, it looks perfect. So we're going to when we use the precision uh, lateral calibration standard, we're going to come in and do auto calibrate. So the nominal value for the pitch is 10 micron, but I know that the certified pitch value uh, by uh, the calibration standard is actually 10.001 micron. And we're going to always want to, if you know the certified pitch value, um, we're always going to want to use that number by best practice. So there we go. Now it becomes bold. And this is going to be our actual magnification. So we're going to see 49.90. Um, so there we go. We, if you have that uh, standard there, that's going to be how you set your uh, lat cal. If you don't have the standard, we're going to use a feature, a known feature. And in this case, I have a ruler on the stage. So let's close this, or let's just leave that there for now. Again, I save that location on the stage. So we're going to come to the scratch pad. We're going to go to our ruler. Let's go to that location. All right, it looks like we're a bit out of focus here. So let's do an autofocus. There we go. You can, we can see that this ruler may have seen some better days, but it should still be serviceable for what we are doing today. Let's do an auto light level. All right, so when we're using a feature of a known dimension, we have three options. We can use uh, a length, or we can even we can also use diameters, and there's two different ways to create those diameter circles. Today we're going to be using a length, so we're going to want to go from edge to edge. I'm going to zoom in here. Now I'm going to drag this across to the next edge here. Do my best to make sure I'm on the edge. Make sure the line is straight. Looks pretty decent. And I'm gonna come when we're doing when we're using a feature where I want to come in and calibrate. I know that this feature is 50 microns. I'm gonna click OK. And you can see that we got a slightly different value. And I mean this is always gonna be less precise because we're gonna we're putting into we're putting some human error into it. But if this is the only option you have, um, I would recommend setting that lat cal, especially if you're looking for lateral features, if you're stitching, it's it's gonna be very critical uh, to your metrology. So there you have it. Let's just go back to the presentation one last time. So we're going to move on to the general Q&A portion. Um, and obviously, if you have any further questions, you can contact us at our site. Um, so if we have any questions, Dan, uh, could you please? Sure. So uh, one question, if you could go back into the MX screen in the lateral calibrator. Yes. Uh, so there was a question of how to pick the appropriate pitch on the lateral calibration standard uh, for your given objective and zoom combination. Um, so actually, if you're using a, a recent version of MX, uh, and if you can pop up the, the lateral calibrator there, Steve, you'll see when you click auto calibrate that there will actually be a recommendation of which pitch to use. So you can see there the recommended pitch. All right, great. Um, Another question, Steve, uh, how did you zoom on the ruler image? So I think here in the lateral calibrator. Oh, so I just used the, I just scrolled with the center piece on the mouse. And then you hold it down to move around in the image. Right. Uh, there's one other question about um, kind of what the major contributions are to the system error. Uh, how would you kind of know if your form error comes from your objective or your silicon carbide flat? The, the best thing to do there uh, is really going to be uh, to kind of take uh, a measurement of the residual after your system reference to measure multiple locations on your silicon carbide flat or your uh, whatever kind of calibration standard you're using. Um, you know, there, there's always going to be uh, some amount of form error in any uh, surface, but the idea, uh, particularly behind the silicon carbide flat that, that we provide, is that um, 
it's uh, it's kind of all random and low order. And so if you average enough, you'd be able to uh, kind of keep driving that down. All right. Does that look like it for the questions, or do we have any more? What do we think? All right. That um, seems. Yeah, nope. I think that I think that'll do it. All right. That seems to be it. And then one last thing before I end the webinar. Um, we do have multiple webinars and training sessions coming up. Here is a quick view of our upcoming sessions. We have a basic scripting in, in MX uh, webinar, then we have the from model to measurements using interferometric data with the optical design software, and then we have a couple other training ses sessions coming up. So those are going to be available on our website, um, and we would appreciate it uh, if you all chose to join those as well. So thank you for joining today. Um, I appreciate it. Um, and I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you.